I'm delighted to launch immediately into our first session where we're going to be talking um, about starting right from the top, really the way in which WASH and Health can work together to overcome advocacy challenges. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our first three speakers to address some of these issues. Um, and we're going to be talking about a wide range actually of angles here from women's health, but also to innovative financial models um, and also all the way to human rights and universal healthcare. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our three first speakers. First up will be um, Dr. May Sule. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy Hi, to May. be here. Um, thank you, May. You are a lecturer in water sanitation and hygiene at Cranfield Water Science Institute. We're also joined by Marta Pronk. Marta, from, you are from the Max Foundation, and you'll be talking to us about some very exciting projects um, in Max tap water. Thank you for and having me. Also... Welcome. And we'll also be joined by Ifioma Okonkwo. Ifioma, your project coordinator at WASH for Impact and Development. And you'll be talking to us about WASH and health from a human rights-based lens. Thank you for having me. Welcome. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to you, May. Uh, May, thank you so much for participating today. And you'll be talking to us about WASH female genital sh schistosomiasis and the wider challenges to women's health. Um, thank you very much, Marianne. I will just try and share my screen now. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, from wherever you're calling in or tuning in from. Thank you very much for joining in. And um, it's a privilege to be here to talk to you about these topics that are quite very close to my heart. So I'm here to talk about WASH, FGS, and the wider challenges to women's health. A brief, um, a brief outline of what I'll be going through, um, FGS, FGS and HIV co-infection, the NTDs, FGS, and WASH. And um, looking at WASH, is WASH really important, considering the evidence base and then looking into a bit of cross-sectoral integration? So what is female genital schistosomiasis, FGS? is defined as the presence of schistosomiasis ova in the female reproductive organs. An estimated 82 million African women are living with schistosoma infections, and an estimated 56 million women and girls are living with FGS. FGS is caused mostly, most frequently by S. hematobium, and the egg granulomas and subsequent disease can occur anywhere in the genital tract. FGS continues to be largely ignored by national and global policy makers, and a lot needs to be done in advocating for FGS from that lens to try and make sure that it's brought to the forefront and is integrated into many of the health uh, programs that are currently going on. So if you look at the gender, social, and environmental determinants of schistosomiasis, the woman and the female and the male, there, there are sex-related differences. For the male, yes, we have the um, diagnosis, they carry a higher HIV viral load. There's increased risk with occupations, then it also causes a weak erections or rapid ejaculation. You have problems around um, older men in some context, not receiving treatment from younger women distributors, and also being a patriarchal system they're able to protect their masculine image, you know, and, and are able to carry on with life. But for the female, it's very different. Diagnosis is difficult. Uh, females are highly stigmatized and are referred to STI clinics as opposed to having treatment when they come in. The lesions caused by FGS are risk factor for HIV acquisition and co-infection. It causes menstrual disturbances, there's pregnancy and childbirth uh, complications, anemia. Young girls experience taunting and late puberty from hormonal disturbances. The lesions continue even after the eggs die so that clinical manifestations can be undetected even after treatment. And women who miss treatment may be more susceptible to organ damage and cancer due to chronic infection. So we realize that even with these increased problems that women are having, 
they still have to keep carrying on with the water contact activities because the household rules and shows just has to carry on. And we also see that some girls end up missing schools because of caring um, res uh, responsibilities or cultural preferences to educate boys. So it's, they end up missing treatment in schools when the MDA activities are going on. So you can see that there's that gender divide that women, the females, are much more likely to be exposed to the transmission and manifest manifestation of um, schistosomiasis through FGS. And this is a, an illustration of how FGS sits in the women's genital and urogenital areas. You can see clearly here from the um, genital area how the eggs are deposited around the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, the ovary. There's a clear deposition of eggs, of hematobion eggs around this area. And also around, along the urogenital area, you can see you have the paired worms that are there. It's, it's all clearly illustrated in this image. And it clearly shows how much the anatomy of the female is affected by schistosomiasis, leading to FGS in women. The World Health Organization has done a lot in terms of education. They've brought out educational materials to help raise awareness for um, healthcare, for healthcare workers people in the health uh, profession who are diagnosing FGS and also in schools to raise awareness amongst girls. So there's this pocket atlas that has been brought out and um, it's quite a nice atlas that you can use and look through and try to understand what FGS is and how it looks like. They've also brought out this, uh, in, within the atlas as well, it has these images and there's a poster that they've brought out. It shows how uh, FGS is diagnosed through visual inspection of the lesions around the vagina, the vaginal wall and the cervix. And um, visualization can be improved by using a digital camera or a colposcope. And um, women, even after being diagnosed, have to keep going into that source of water. They, they keep, the risk is still there. But it's also especially important that we're able to identify girls at a very early age and begin to treat them with a praziquantel. The symptoms of FGS include vaginal discharge, there's bloody discharge, bleeding after intercourse or squatting, there's general itching or burning sensation, and there's also the pelvic pain or pain during or after intercourse. There's a lot of complications like I've I highlighted already. There's bleeding, um, there's infertility, you can have abortion or ectopic pregnancy. There is um, urinary incontinence when women urinate, when they cough, laugh or jump, which can be very embarrassing. Um, their genital ulcers and the tumors or swelling around the vulva, the vagina, and the cervix. It's very, a, a very uncomfortable situation for women. But the good thing is that regular treatment with praziquantel from an early age prevents schistosomiasis from progressing to genital damage and other related complications. Then we now go on to H, uh, FGS and HIV co-infection. There is increased susceptibility to HIV infection through disruption of the vaginal and cervical epithelium caused by the erosion or inflammation that is caused by FGS. Um, it's uh, currently women living with FGS are at greater risk of HIV infection and poor sexual and reproductive health. Um, this can be prevented with praziquantel, as we've said, and it's just a matter of uh, social justice and human rights, health rights of women. We need to be able to uh, partner and integrate programs to be able to expand our interventions to reach women, especially with uh, HIV treatment and also treat them with praziquantel for schistosomiasis. The UN AIDS have brought out this document with these key messages and is a very, um, ex it's an excellent step in the right direction basically because they have brought out in this document clearly how there are links between FGS and HIV and how we should be able to integrate these sexual and reproductive health interventions to improve the lives of women generally. And this is some images from uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and the African continent. It's trying to look at the overlaps between schistosomiasis infection, HIV prevalence, FGS and infertility. The map here, the first uh, African map, and at the top left corner, it's 
shows prevalence of hematobium infection in school children in sub-Saharan Africa from 2000 upwards. The top right corner shows HIV prevalence in African adults. And then the bottom um, image C shows where reports of FGS have been published in African countries. That's where you can see they are shaded in red. And then the last picture, the bottom um, right here, shows secondary infertility in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at this, there's clearly an overlap. If you put these maps together, you can see that there are linkages between hematobium infection, HIV prevalence, FGS reported in African countries, and the infertility in sub-Saharan Africa. So more needs to be done because of this co-infection of FGS and HIV. HIV has a lot of attention that has been put to it. So if we're able to integrate the treatment and management of FGS with HIV, it will be able, we'll be able to go a long way in reducing the um, consequences of FGS infection. Some systematic uh, review findings, recent ones, this is 2021. This uh, re systematic review findings of 26 studies found that there was a prevalence of HIV amongst people with schistosomiasis and vice versa. There was a prevalence of schistosomiasis among HIV positive people. However, um, no specific summary estimate for FGS was generated. And that shows there's a clear research gap as well that we need to try and make that association for FGS and um, HIV. Then we now go on to psychosocial distress. Women are not only having to deal with the physical manifestation of lack of water, sanitation, hygiene, but they have to deal with the psychosocial distress as well. We can see that uh, at every life stage, women, whether they are young or old, once they don't have access to wash, around the um, urban or rural settings, there's a lot of sanitation related and water related stressors that they go through. And this includes barriers to access, the discomforts, identification, <laughs> issues of privacy, social restrictions, social conflict. And sometimes women are able to come up with some behavioral regulation to cope with these stresses. They try to seek social support, they travel in groups, they try to change their behavior the time of day that they're able to go into the toilet. So they have to hold themselves in, not being able to access any um, toilet at all, or go, if it's open defecation, they still have to hold it in until the time of the day when they feel comfortable to do that. And all this generates a lot of psychosocial stress amongst women. Similarly, profound mental health effects from FGS can equally cause social stigma, such as depression and marital discord. So women are having to deal with a lot of mental health issues around lack of adequate wash and the issues of FGS, HIV, and every other disease that uh, most times affects women the most. We also think of menstrual hygiene. We have been saying we should leave no one behind, but sadly a lot of girls have been left behind. A lot of women have been left behind. There's a mental trauma in terms of menstrual hygiene. They don't have access to water or sanitation to be able to adequately manage themselves during their periods. You can see um, COVID has only highlighted the importance of hard washing with soap and water. But a lot of times these people do not have access to water or soap to be able to maintain their personal hygiene. They don't have access to um, tampons or pads to be able to keep themselves clean when they're going through their period. A lot of education is needed around the stigmas and the taboos. For example, in India, about 52% of girls don't get any information about periods before they start menstruating. 70% of girls in Afghanistan don't bathe when menstruating for fear of becoming infertile. And in Bangladesh, 68% of girls actually avoid being around men and boys when they're menstruating, which means the girls don't go to school when they're menstruating. So you can see how much there will be a gap in their education and subsequently they are kept in this trap of um, poverty and not being able to break that gender divide. So it's a vicious circle. Girls, women and girls are affected by a lack of water, hygiene and sanitation, and it keeps it just a continuous cycle that we need to be able to break as well. Their girls are responsible for collecting water, looking after the family, carrying the water, causing problems on uh, to their heads, to their backs, risking their health. 
then exposing them to diarrhea diseases, to schistosomiasis, FGS, managing ch periods is challenging to them. The risk of sexual ha harassment is there as well. So it's just a cycle that we need to speak out more about to be able to get that intervention to break the vicious cycle. And poor sanitation also contaminates our drinking water sources. The schistosome eggs are washed into our water bodies, into our food crops, it spreads the disease amongst the wider population. So definitely toilets are there to improve that gender equality, education and, and the environment. And toilets also protect women and girls' dignity, safety and health. And it's also very good for managing FGS. And um, Water Aid has brought out a report of recent for every $1 invested in basic sanitation, up to $5 is returned in saved medical costs, in increased productivity, and jobs are created along the entire service chain. Um, here are a list of the entities. And if you see clearly, I just want to highlight how a lot of the entities are affected by WASH whether it's in terms of breaking the transmission circle or in terms of the management of the disease itself. So WASH is quite very important for entities management and for FGS as well. And that's where we consider the best framework. The importance of WASH for the entities is clearly highlighted in the best framework, uh, behavior, toilet use and maintenance, hand washing, personal hygiene, food hygiene, environment, the construction of safe sanitation systems, water management for vector control to break this uh, cycle of transmission, waste disposal, um, social inclusion where stigma is prevented in access to wash services and also reducing the severity of symptoms that is likely to result in exclusion and the treatment and care of these entities as well. Water supply, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare settings at home for self-care and for rehabilitation of affected individuals. And when we talk of behavior change, we need to try to also make a distinction between the different behaviors. There's a behavior that is optional. When you talk of recreation, it's an optional behavior. But if you look at the bottom pictures, these are women who don't have a choice. It's a transmitting behavior. They don't have a choice. They have to go in there to collect water for domestic purposes to look after the family. And so should we be rethinking the whole systems approach in terms of wash delivery and entities? Water contact is not all mediated by wash interventions. So we have to consider that the role of hygiene, the use of soap, water storage and household water treatment, access to toilets, social norms, behavior change, who is doing what and why, which behaviors should and can change and whose behavior? Is it the people who are at bottom end who are suffering or the behaviors of people in government or the behaviors of those who make policies, whose behavior should be changing. Because if we do the right thing, if we put the policies in place, we're able to provide the funds that are needed, a lot of these problems will be alleviated. And um, research, there's a lot of evidence on wash and schistosomiasis. It has proven that um, increased access to wash reduces the odds of infection. There's a need for adequate, more adequate studies and rigorous um, studies as well. Um, sanitation has been associated with lower odds of infection. There is definitely a clear gap in intervention studies. So more implementation research or operational research needs to be carried out to be able to have a clear link for these um, relationships to be able to prove that wash and schistosomiasis indeed, wash can indeed be um, a way of reducing um, NTDs generally, not just schistosomiasis and a way of coping with those for those who have already been infected and then more work needs to be done as well especially on wash and fgs so what's the way forward we have been talking about cross-sectoral collaboration on wash and ntds definitely a paradigm shift is needed from agenda setting to policy formulation and planning to um, legitimation the implementation and execution of our projects to monitoring and eval evaluation and how to maintain and sustain all the interventions. A cross-sectoral collaboration definitely is what will work in this case. We also have to consider gender mainstreaming in the project cycle in terms of formulation, um, who, is part, who is involved in the project. We have to be able to collect and analyze sex disaggregated data so that we're able to clearly show um, the results and how much it impacts gender. Because if we're able to show this link clearly, more will be done 
towards the female or the women angle in trying to resolve a lot of the issues around women's health. Uh, we should be able to integrate our prevention and control measures. This is a recent um, article and it has clearly shown how we can integrate the prevention and control measures of FGS, of HIV and cervical cancer because they are all interlinked. And if you just solve one, the others are not going to go away. If we're able to integrate these measures, we're able to work towards integrated programs that will resolve a lot of the issues around women's health and improve the quality and experiences of women generally in developing countries, especially amongst the poor. So um, these are some of the references here, if you're interested to look at them. And thank you very much for listening. May, thank you so much. What a start to the day. You've managed in just a few minutes to um, remind us of the impact of WASH to all the NTDs. You've also told us about the BEST framework, which uh, so many of the NGOs and partners involved at the NNN have been working and applying to these very concrete um, problems and situations. Um, I think that we uh, had Temple Oraiki summarized it very nicely. Temple, hello, and Temple saying, wow, these stats are disturbing. More health workers need to be involved in WASH advocacy. And I think that although some of your slides made for difficult viewing, that was important viewing. Yes, as Temple said, we need much more involvement on the advocacy level. We need to really hone that common language as well so that the collaborations can be a lot easier and perhaps that the WASH aspects aren't an afterthought for the health professionals and vice versa. The health considerations aren't an afterthought for um, engineers and urban planners thinking about their systems going forward. And so May, a huge thank you for opening this day putting a lot of material and content out there for us to think about today. And I think that provides a really nice kind of um, segue into Marta's presentation. We're talking about urban planning and really putting health at the center of WASH interventions and infrastructure. And Marta, your work's been really exciting, not just in terms of bringing safe water to neglected communities, but also in really thinking about the sustainability of this and sustainability is what it's all about. So Marty, I'll hand over to you. We look forward to hearing about all the work at the Max Foundation and in particular, the Max Tap Water Projects. Thank you so much, Marianne. Let me just share my screen. I hope it's uh, visible now. It's perfect. Thank you so much. Great. So good day, everyone uh, around the world. I'm glad you could join us today here. So my name is Marge Pronk. Uh, I'm the business development manager for Max Foundation, as well as for Max Step Water, which is a social safe water enterprise. And previously, I worked for Lepra in the UK as the program manager on their programs for leprosy and LF in Bangladesh. So today it's my absolute pleasure to be speaking at this ISNTD water conference. And I want to talk to you all about the work that Max Step Water is doing on building pipe water networks as a solution to bringing safe running water to homes in rural Bangladesh and its importance for NTDs. So this is me uh, around uh, four years ago, visiting a community with people affected uh, by leprosy in Northern Bangladesh. You've made my life hell. That is what a young woman from this community told me during this visit. And so naturally I asked her why. And she said, because you people keep telling my father needs to wash his feet every day. And that actually made me happy because that is one of the communication messages for people uh, with leprosy. But then she told me, guess who needs to bring that water with us to drag that water to the house all day. I spend all my day now uh, just trying to get him the water that he needs. And it was this conversation that led me to switching careers and to develop Max Step Water, which builds and operates mini grids for pipe water that supply households with easy, safe and affordable running water at home. So to tell the story of 
Max Stepwater, I should start by telling the story of Max Foundation. And this is Max Lepola. He's the son of our founders. He died in 2005 at the age of 10 months old due to a very common viral infection. And this event led his parents to set up Max Foundation because they wanted to make sure that no other parent has to go through what they've been through. And so they founded Max Foundation and started to work in Bangladesh in 2005. And our mission is to ensure that every child has a healthy start in life and to do that in the most effective and the most long lasting way. And we do that by addressing three main uh, areas, which are nutrition, safe motherhood, and I think most importantly for today's discussion, WASH. So first, I would like to set the scene a little bit around uh, uh, what is the context for WASH and entities in Bangladesh. Um, which is where Max Foundation has been working from the start because there was a high need um, and also a, a possibility to have a, um, a high reach for a relatively low investment because of the population density that we have here in Bangladesh. So looking at the WASH context, um, it is actually improving, but the national data masks a huge disparity between urban and uh, rural areas. And in rural Bangladesh, we can see that still 38% of households do not have access to safely managed water, um, and one in two do not have access to safe or even to basic sanitation, really. And in Bangladesh, uh, water is never far away. Many of you might know this. We have a lot of water issues here. But that actually becomes one of the challenges when we talk about changing the wash, wash situation. Um, because households rely on tube well water for drinking, um, but they go to ponds and rivers for uh, the water for all other domestic purposes. So for cleaning, for bathing, uh, uh, washing utensils, etc. And in Bangladesh, these sources are very close, um, but they're also very unsafe. Um, in addition, and I think uh, this was also um, very nicely shown in, in the presentation by May earlier, is that also in Bangladesh, it's women and girls who are predominantly responsible for, for water collection. And they have to spend up to one and a half hours every day on average uh, on water collection. And often they face a lot of sexual harassment or, or gender violence along the way. Um, if we look at the NTDs in Bangladesh, there are actually uh, four NTDs which are endemic to the country, which are leprosy, LF, BL, uh, and soil transmitted helminths. Um, a lot of work has been done on, hel on VL in the, in the past, and the cases are uh, really dropping to below uh, the hundreds, so that's really good news. But I think in the context of ISNTD today, it's also important to mention that uh, dengue is really increasing year by year in Bangladesh. So research shows that um, piped water improves health and it actually does so in a number of different ways. Uh, and I think it goes back to, to the presentation that was, was given earlier. Um, so first of all, it, it helps with physical health because it reduces when you don't need to carry water uh, to the home. Uh, it reduces a lot of incidents of, of chronic pain, back pains, also of injuries. We have a lot of problems with uh, slipping and falling, especially during rainy season. Um, and this really puts physical health at risk. Um, also, what we're seeing with pipe water access is that people that have a disability um, get access, get much better access to um, safe water and safe sanitation inside the house. Um, there's also a very important effect on menstrual health, uh, which improves when girls can maintain the hygiene at home. And this also has a knock-on effect on sexual and reproductive health. Um, for example, with the ability to bathe whenever you want, instead of having to do that at a public place. Um, and also with uh, reduced incidence of, of sexual harassment uh, with women no longer having, being exposed to that when they're going to collect water. And we also see that this is an important effect on the mental health of women um, when they face less hassle and when they face less harassment. And, and what they're also indicating is that they now have more time for themselves. They have more time actually for um, caring for their children as well. 
At the same time, we find that pipe water has a multiplying effect on sanitation as well, because when you have a piped water connection, it then makes sense also to invest in an improved toilet in your house, for example. And this together, so pipe water and safe sanitation also helps in reducing vector-borne diseases because it takes away, for example, common breeding places such as water storage tanks. But most importantly, especially for Max Foundation, is that it shows that uh, our data shows that pipe water reduces stunting um, and that healthy children who have stronger immune systems are actually also less vulnerable um, for some of the entities, like, for example, leprosy. So I wanted to uh, take a look a bit more, uh, a bit further look into this, uh, the reduction of stunting. So this is actually data um, from 50,000 children that we've been tracking for the last two years in over 1,600 villages where Max Foundation is implementing its Healthy Village program. Um, and the dots on this graph represent the percentage of stunted children across all villages, given coverage of uh, both access to safe water and access to sanitation. Now, I should note that these are correlations and we did not yet prove causation, but the data looks very interesting. And this is definitely um, something that we're looking to see how we can build this evidence further. And what you can see here is that for water, there is about a 15% drop in the stunting rate between having uh, no coverage of safe water uh, and having full coverage of safe water. And then if we look at sanitation, we actually see that it's almost double that. And what I find very interesting also is the contrast, contrast in these graphs. Um, you could see that the effect for safe water keeps benefiting children the more coverage there is. For sanitation, it seems to sort of flatten out between 75 and 100%, um, so that it looks like the community doesn't benefit as a whole, but of course, individuals still benefit um, from having a, a better sanitation. And we don't yet understand exactly the reason why. So I think this is an area for, um, for further research. So the question then becomes, how do, we, um, how do we make sure that these rural households in quite underserved communities, far away from, from urban, uh, urban areas, um, how do they get water? Because for us, for, it was very important to ensure that households don't just have access to safe drinking water. We actually want to ensure that households have uh, access to a sufficient quantity of safe water for all the domestic needs. And this is also in line with what WHO recommends, um, that you need about 80 to 100 liters of water a day, actually, if you want to obtain uh, optimum health levels. And so just safe drinking water is not enough. And how, so how do we bring, uh, that was our question, how do we bring pipe water into rural areas that are not served by municipal utility services? And that is why Max Foundation um, developed Max Tap Water, which is a, a pipe water supply service. And Max Tap Water delivers 24 seven water, uh, about 80 to 100 liters per person, good quality groundwater in up to three connections in per household. So usually a household will have a connection uh, around the kitchen or hand washing area. Uh, they often build a shower and then have another connection um, in a toilet area. And we currently have 27 installations up and running. And, and as, we're as we're speaking, we're actually building the next 20 installations. So how does it really work? Um, as I said, Max Tap Water is based, it's set up as a social uh, uh, safe water enterprise. And what we do is that we build and operate mini grids that give households a connection to a pipe water network. And each grid connects around 75 households. So these grids are not technically complicated. They're actually really simple and all materials are locally sourced. But the innovation is the business model. So that, that business model works with the local entrepreneur who can co-invest and who also manages the grid at the local level. Um, and also this model works with this small scale cluster based approach rather than going to huge networks. So each customer pays a, a one time connection fee and then a monthly subscription for the water. 
And this allows us to uh, make it a sustainable business that is able to scale and to uh, to scale actually without needing continuous charity grants. And that's something that we want to do in over a five year period. Um, and so we're planning to build an another 180 grids over the next five years. We are a new company and uh, as any new company, we're facing lots of challenges. Um, there's a few that I wanted to highlight here today. So first of all, we are aware that with pipe water connections, we see increased water use. And actually this is also on the one end, this is something that we want to encourage because often that's also needed for a hygienic lifestyle. Um, but that could also mean wastage of water and having the right kind of drainage then becomes very important. Um, we realize that in terms of introducing drainage into the community, uh, you have to start by first introducing pipe water networks because it doesn't make sense for uh, a community or for a household to start investing in drainage if they don't yet have the water connection. So we figured let's start with pipe water first and move into drainage later. Also, we are a social company. So although we do our best to keep our tariff uh, affordable, uh, there's always a group uh, for which the service might be out of reach. And we try to include them in different ways, for example, by linking with um, certain government programs that are around to, to help vulnerable groups. Um, but at the end of the day, we also have to look at, uh, uh, for, at the sustainability of our business. Um, and that means that we might not uh, reach 100% coverage everywhere. A question that we get asked often is how can we scale this model to other countries? Um, I find that a quite a difficult question to, uh, to answer because I do think that the circumstances in Bangladesh are quite unique. For example, we have this availability of good quality groundwater here, which makes this a, a much easier to run. And so I think that this question, the answer to this question will depend on uh, the circumstances, uh, particular circumstances of, of the, that particular country. Finally, um, also looking at the, the theme of today around advocacy, um, I think one of our challenges definitely is how do we convince local government and national governments that pipe water is a, a viable and a sustainable option for rural communities if it's done in the right way. So to do that, actually, um, we will need to show further track record. We need to show further evidence. Uh, we're seeing in our discussions with government that that is what they really need to see. Um, but we want to get their endorsement that this kind of social water business model um, is an alternative way for pipe water supply um, in rural areas. So with that, uh, I want to end and also say that this is an open invitation to everyone. If you believe that you can uh, help us improve our model further, if you can help us, um, you know, go to the next level, please reach out to me. I want to go back to that uh, young woman and her father in that community up in the north here um, and help them uh, make their life better. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Your, um, the model has been described as awesome by Bjorg Garang, and I think that's been really inspirational. We hear your call for partnership and involvement loud and clear, so I think many will be following up on that. And it's really interesting to start to think about moving from this intervention to a kind of service model and around all the advocacy that that is there. So I think we'll be bringing all this together in our discussion in a few moments. But one kind of overarching framing that would uh, apply to both the issues May highlighted, the ones which you did as well, Marcia, would be to consider this um, WASH and NTV interventions and collaboration under the human rights lens. Uh, building on the UHC movement. And for that, um, we're going to hand over now for a few moments uh, to our third speaker, Ifioma Okonkwo. Ifioma, your project coordinator um, at WASH for Impact and Development. 
So we look forward to being able to hear your experiences all the way from the grassroots level, but also how you're working to increase advocacy at a higher level based on your programs and your interventions in the community. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be joining to this session. My name is Ifoma Okonkwo and I am the project coordinator for WashField. WashField is an acronym for Water Sanitation and Hygiene for Impact and Development. WashField is a youth-led organization that is based in Nigeria and our focus is on alleviating water sanitation and hygiene challenges across Africa. In today's session, I'll be speaking on making universal healthcare a reality through human rights-based approach and responsibility-based approach. What do we mean when we say universal healthcare? Universal healthcare means making quality health services available for all. In this context, I would love to emphasize on the term quality. Is it possible to make quality health services available for all without having access to wash facilities? I know you said no, because it is absolutely impossible. Because the role of WASH in ensuring universal healthcare cannot be overemphasized. WASH has a crucial role to play in ensuring universal healthcare. According to the WHO, WASH in healthcare facilities refers to the provision of water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities and infrastructures in all parts of the health center or the hospital. It said all parts of the facilities, of the health facilities. Now, it did not say in just the wards or in just the offices. It is expected that all parts of the hospitals have wash services. It went further to say that the health system and the wash system cannot operate independent of one another. Now, what does that mean? It means that there can be no health system without wash system. You cannot tell me you have a hospital and you don't have a wash system there. You can't tell me you have a hospital, you don't have a toilet, you don't have um, hand hygiene facilities, you don't, you don't have water, you don't have a good source of water. It is absolutely not acceptable for you to have a health system or a health center there has to be wash system. The COVID-19 pandemic being a wash-centric pandemic has also made it more glaring to all of us the importance of wash and not just in the hospitals but also in our daily lives. We saw that at the peak of the pandemic it was almost impossible to fight the virus without access to wash. That was when we were told to wash our hands without access to hygiene services, without hack and um, access to water it was almost impossible for you to protect yourself from the virus however it was at the peak of this pandemic that we noticed the stark reality of lack of wash services in most health centers in nigeria during the course of the um, the high rate of the pandemic we at wash feed we deemed it, we deemed it fit to fit, um, visit some hospitals to um, ascertain the state of their wash services since it was a criteria for not just health workers to protect themselves but also patients it was important that um, they had um, access to wash services in their hospitals and it was really really um, it was it was it was really an um it wasn't a good site because in most of the hospitals we visited they didn't have access to wash services some had um water but they didn't have toilets some have toilets but they didn't have hand hygiene um facilities and all that so this um covid 19 pandemic actually exposed the stark reality that most of these health workers who are at the forefront of fighting viruses, fighting pandemics, even treating ailments, they do not have access to wash facilities that could help them protect themselves. And this, is, this exposes them to avoidable risks of infection due to the lack of these wash services. Now, it is very important to know that access to water and sanitation is a fundamental human right and a denial of these facilities to health workers is actually a violation of their human rights. 
when they do not have access to wash services, when patients do not have access to wash services, we are violating their human rights. It is good to know that on the 28th day of July 2010, the United Nations General Assembly made a resolution that explicitly recognized the human rights to water and sanitation. In this resolution, it was called upon that states and international organizations provide safe clean, accessible, and affordable drinking water and sanitation to all. That being said, ensuring access to safe water and sanitation for all is a legal obligation. It is a human right to provide safe drinking water and it is entitled to everyone without discrimination to have access to sufficient, to safe, to acceptable, to physically accessible and affordable water for both personal and domestic use. While the human right to sanitation entitles everyone in all spheres of life to have access to sanitation facilities. When you talk about sanitation facilities now, you're talking about toilets. And those toilets are meant to be safe, they're meant to be hygienic, they're meant to be secure, and they're meant to be culturally and socially acceptable. We are proposing that we use the human rights-based approach because it is the best legal protection we have. We are proposing the use of human rights-based approach in order to have access to wash services in hospitals because it is the best legal protection that we have. In using this approach, we have two key players. We have the duty bearers and we have the rights holders. The duty bearers are the government or the contracted companies that are meant to provide water or sanitation services to the people. And then the rights holders are we, the citizens. And we, the right holders, we have the power to challenge the government when they do not provide us with these facilities. Now, that is why we are proposing the use of this, um, of this human rights-based approach. Because now, our government have signed the resolution that, yes, they are going to provide the citizens with water. But now, you look around you and you don't have access to water, you don't have access to sanitation services. So now you can use the fact that this is, this, um, this is a case of them trampling on your human rights to actually challenge them. Actually, most people do not know about this. Most people do not know that access to water and sanitation is their fundamental human right. Because while we're carrying out our survey in some health centers in Nigeria, we spoke to some of the health workers to find out if they actually know that access to water, sanitation, and what access to water and sanitation is their fundamental human right. Some of them did not know, while some of them did know. Those who knew that access to water and sanitation were their fundamental human rights, they were scared of challenging the government because of fear of losing their job or being victimized. So they didn't want to be in that space. They just want to do their job, get paid and go home. So we decided in Washfield to create a, a platform. This is an online platform that helps health workers, helps patients to upload, to bring in and state the, the state of their wash facilities in their hospital. Um, in, this, um, in this platform, you as a as a health worker, you as a patient, you can come online and upload pictures of the wash facilities in the hospital you work or the hospital you visited. Why this is to help health workers, it is also to help governments and um, donor agencies in their interventions because when you come to the site, you can um, have um, this data of the state of wash facilities in this hospital and then it can also guide you and help you to know the hospitals or health centers that are in their need of wash interventions so primarily this is what the platform is for also it can also help researchers in getting data of these um, wash states of hospitals across nigeria we just launched this platform, so we are still developing it. We are also looking for collaborations on how we are going to um, project the site and also expand it. So this is what we are working on presently. Now, when you talk about the human rights-based approach, like I said, 
where you have to challenge your duty bearers to provide you with these wash services now what happens when they have provided you with the services do you just um, use them misuse them and all that that's where the responsibility based approach comes in we are urging citizens we are urging the right holders to take responsibility of this project to take responsibility of these facilities when you have used the human rights based approach to get access to wash facilities now it is upon you to make sure that these facilities are properly taken care of you make sure that they are properly maintained and you don't misuse them because it is very common to see government projects and um, infrastructures being misused by people and you see they they are usually not sustainable because they are they are not well maintained because they are misused and all that so that is why we are calling on citizens to um we are calling on citizens to take responsibility of this project to see that when the government, when you have used the human rights based approach to get these facilities to your hospitals or to your communities, that you make sure that these facilities, these infrastructures are taken care of. You take ownership of these projects, you take ownership of these infrastructures and with this it will give this facilities a longer lifespan it will help them to be sustainable in talking about um universal health care um making it a reality i want to also implement that when there is access to wash it also helps in preventing the neglected tropical diseases ntds it is known that most of these ntds thrive in Areas that do not have access to what um, wash facilities, areas that have poor access to wash services. So when we have been able to implement these wash services in our communities, in our hospitals, it will go a long way in preventing the neglected tropical diseases where people do not have to contract these diseases because they, they do not have access to wash services so in providing wash services to the people to the hospitals you are creating universal health care and we are making universal health care a reality so i'm urging everyone let us look into the human rights based approach look into the responsibility based approach in ensuring that wash facilities are provided in hospitals and also in our communities Thank you very much. We are going to just start to take a few of the questions that have been really pouring in um, during both your presentations, actually. Uh, a lot of detail, I suppose, on the FGS as well, maybe from colleagues who aren't particularly working in this area. Lots of question marks remain, as you showed us really clearly, May, particularly in male genital schistosomiasis, and perhaps we can come back to those in a bit. But maybe just to start off the discussions, I would just like to ask all of you in a broader sense, um, based on your work, based on your experience, um, what really would you like to see happen now to accelerate and help the fields that you're working in in terms of advocacy, whether it be really at the high level in international organizations or perhaps at the funding level, or even just um, in local governments or municipalities where you've been working. May, perhaps I'll ask you first. Okay, so um, for me, it's more to do with funding and policy and that is at international level and at national and local levels as well. At international level, I think a lot has been done in terms of putting forward guidelines that have used some of the data that has been available. But clearly, as we have seen, a lot of data is still required in terms of research and data. There are a lot of gaps that are still there. And to be able to um, convince some of the funders, you have to be able to prove that you have done some work on the ground and you have some data available to be able to back up the um, stats that you are putting forward in terms of the reality on ground. So that funding for research is very important and that funding for implementation is very important. So it comes down to policy again, because if governments have prioritized these issues, 
then they will be able to put in funds for it. So how high on the agenda are some of these issues that we have highlighted? If they're not um, given a lot of importance, then government will not put money into it. But if government puts a lot of importance in these things, then they are more likely to put in the policies in place, the relevant policies in place, and back it up with the funding so that um, the programs can trickle down to the people on the ground who are most in need of these interventions. Um, with the international community, more advocacy needs to be done because they can pressure some of these governments. After all, the governments have all signed into the, signed up to the SDGs. They were all uh, included during the planning stages. A lot of stakeholder engagement was done during the SDG formulation and true to the signing process of the final goals and the targets that were put forward. Almost every country was represented. So they should hold them to account to uh, make sure that they are including a lot of these guides to be able to put policies in place and do the programs that are necessary to achieve the targets for the SDGs. At the moment, we need to quadruple our, effect, uh, our efforts in WASH if we want to meet the SDG 2030 target, because we're almost tolling. It's like the, the line is plateauing, it's not going up. So we have to do more. We need to quadruple our, if, our efforts. The recent um, JMP monitoring report shows clearly that we're off target if we want to meet the target for the um, SDG 6 by 2030. And we know the links that WASH has to other um, SDGs. It's clearly impacts health, um, uh, women's health especially. It impacts on uh, gender. It impacts on uh, poverty. It impacts on nutritional um, attainment and you know the environment, everything. Water and sanitation relates to a lot of the SDGs. And if we want to see that come to pass, if we want to meet our target, then a quadrupling of efforts in all spheres is definitely what is needed at the moment. Thank you, May. Amartya, would you like to add to this? Yes, well, I, I completely second what, uh, what May has said. I think maybe to add to that as well, what I would really like to see is also um, almost, I feel like there needs to be more sense of daring uh, um, from governments as well to be able to um, see risk these or not risk but um, challenge themselves as well to to try new approaches I feel um, there is almost a complacency with a lot of governments that in terms of how do we provide wash there is you know it's like oh have a tube well and have a pit latrine and, and that sort of you know, the same model that we've been doing for the same technologies that we've been using for the last 50, 100 years, there seems very little innovation there, or very, very little willingness for, for governments to, to invest in new, um, new ways of delivering services. And I would also like to challenge, uh, see that the national governments are also challenging local governments um, to, to pick this up more and to, to try to implement different approaches so that it's not only um, a charity model or an NGO model or not only a, a sort of a big government municipal utility system that, that that's almost seems to be the two ends of the spectrum. But I think there are many more um, ways that we can provide water and sanitation services. <laughs> Thank you. That's really interesting. And I'm just going to turn now to the audience. And thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. Um, just perhaps building on what you were saying, Marcia, there was some two quite different questions, but that were really interesting in terms of with, within this model that you've described to us, thinking about the communities themselves. And uh, one question came from Bior Garang, who applauds the model and uh, describes it as awesome, as I said earlier on. Uh, but Bior was wondering why shouldn't the model figure in a way that it's the communities rather than an entrepreneur investing uh, in the project, this would make sure that the communities are empowered and own the projects, as opposed to having perhaps some antagonism with a private investor and in a completely different field, but also an interesting question, just really thinking about 
engaging and bringing those communities on board. Uh, Maxen Agnolito. Hi, Maxen, was asking, was again, starts by saying, this is fantastic. And Maxen was wondering whether you thought about the cultural beliefs about utilization of the system. For example, in Uganda, one of the misconceptions uh, that Maxon's team found about tap water was that it didn't taste as good compared to the lake water. So two different things, but sort of how, what is your approach in really listening to the community and perhaps placing them right at the center of both the ownership and the project itself? Yeah, very good questions. And um, as I said, this was a, a long process to develop uh, um, uh, to develop this model. So definitely these kinds of questions have, have also come up uh, along the way. Um, going to the second question first. So what we, terms in what we found in terms of belief of the community, um, I think the biggest thing in Bangladesh itself is that there's a strong belief that um, water is a gift from God and you should not pay for it. Um, so the way, so water, the water itself, you shouldn't pay for it. But we always also always explain this to the community, and and then there is a sense of of understanding and willingness to pay. We say the water is free, but you have to pay for the service of getting it to your house, and this is very acceptable to to people in, in Bangladesh. That there is this understanding that okay, if there's the services that it's coming to my house directly. Um, this this doesn't in order to maintain the system, costs will have to be made, and so we have to pay for the water. Um, the water is actually from the same source as uh, a tube well, so both are coming from the groundwater aquifer if, it goes, if it's about drinking water. So in that sense, it tastes the same. The biggest difference is that the tube well water, because it's, uh, you get it more directly, it's cold. And so it tastes nice and fresh. Whereas obviously when you have it from the pipe water system, uh, some of the pipes are exposed to, to water. And so they might be, uh, sorry, to sun. So they might be, a, it, the water might be warmer. So that's one of the, the things in terms of taste. Um, I think what I didn't have time to explain in this presentation is that, uh, so the model actually, the way we set it up is that the community also co-invests. So through the connection fee, that is a way for the community, for each household to actually co-invest and that pays for part of the infrastructure. Um, but we found it and, and we actually tested different models. So we tested models where then a local entrepreneur also co-invested and where they did not. Um, what seems to be the problem in Bangladesh is that it, if there is not this local entrepreneur, so someone who really takes the ownership and who also feels that ownership because they've, they've co-invested themselves. So there is a motivation for them to keep the system running, to maintain the service level. Um, then it becomes a sustainable model because we've seen uh, where it was only the community um, that was responsible. Uh, I think it falls into some of the uh, well-known challenges around any community-based model is that no one uh, tends to take the, the full responsibility. It only works for as long as there is an NGO maybe to guide the community. Uh, when the NGO project is over, the, the model often collapses. This is at least what we found in similar system in Bangladesh. Brilliant, thank you so much. And perhaps now a question for May. Uh, you had a question here from Professor Uwem Ekpo. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Um, professor says, excellent presentation. May, what can we do to manage FGS um, at primary healthcare level where diagnostic facilities and trained healthcare are lacking? Um, well, I think that that's one of the problems. The, the, it's a major problem when you don't have diagnostics facilities at primary health care level. And I think the onus falls on the government, at uh, state government especially, to be able to provide those um, the technical facility and the capacity to be able to do that. A lot of times that's why we have uh, FGS being misdiagnosed and set, uh, people are told they have STIs instead and further stigmatization arises from that because if you if it's FGS then you're more you have more sympathy from the health personnel who are looking at you but if it's STI then it 
it's a different connotation and you are much more likely to be stigmatized if it's an STI that you have. So I think what should be done is at primary care level, the government should provide the resources to the communities, the health com um, facilities there to be able to um, diagnose the community and um, people within the community who are suffering from FGS. A lot of it should also be tied down to some of the health outcomes, I believe. And if this is adequately um, regulated, you know, you have more outcomes, positive outcomes from this. It's just that there is lack of political will. So you realize that other more flashy uh, interventions are being um, looked into. Uh, but they, they provide them with funds, whereas these ones are not considered as glamorous. So there's less attention given to it. There's less funding that is going into it. But if we want to succeed, then we definitely need to um, be very clear about the diagnostic process, providing the equipment the, uh, that is required at primary healthcare level for this to be diagnosed and for women to be treated. We also need to ensure that the medical personnel are well trained to be able to diagnose uh, this disease because it's not um, to th their credit, so to say, when they don't and they, when they're not able to make this right diagnosis. So they need that training. The capacity has to be built. It's a multi, it, it's not a one uh, approach. It's not a one bullet, you know. So we need to be able to be able to look at it in different dimensions from the capacity building to having the equipment available to also having the personnel available on ground at the primary healthcare level. That way we'll be able to make a headway with this. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a few questions here for Martia. Um, bit more, looking a bit more at the detail of, for example, the pricing. Um, a question from Temple Oreiki. Did you carry out a tariff study prior to rollout to ensure a pro-poor approach is considered? Um, and also, um, slightly connected, question from uh, Ramadani Bofu. Congratulations for the nice presentation, Marta. What is the feasibility of this model in terms of affordability and sustainability in semi-arid regions? Thank you. Um, yes, we did carry out a, a tariff analysis. We carried one out in January 20, well, different ones throughout the period. The sort of semi last one we carried out in January 2020, one month before COVID hit and there were uh, big lockdowns in Bangladesh actually throughout these last two years. Um, so, and that has really affected uh, the income of the communities in, in which we operate. So we actually uh, redid our tariff study a few months ago um, and also adapted the price because we could see that uh, it had significantly affected the ability and the willingness to pay uh, for water because uh, a lot of people have had to go into debts uh, due, to the, due to the lockdowns in this country. Um, related to that, I think the question around how would this model work in semi-arid regions um, it's a difficult one to answer because it it really I think depends on the the you know what is your water source. What I would say is that when you need to add treatment, so we have this opportunity in Bangladesh because there is a good quality groundwater available in the aquifer that doesn't need a lot of treatment. Where whenever the more treatment you need to add, the more expensive it becomes. Um, and I think that really starts to go into the affordability uh, of the model. Um, so I think it would it would be challenging in those areas. Wonderful. And um, just to uh, highlight, uh, uh, Professor Ekpo was just kind of bringing this together under a really interesting angle in spite of the effort to let the watch people see NTD as a priority uh, that has not been necessarily productive. Maybe it's time to advocate for using 
washbone NTDs as a barometer to measure the performance of the wash sector in NTD communities. And perhaps uh, this really is uh, for you, May, and for you, Marta, perhaps using these very um, important indicators of health in communities could be uh, another way to quantify in very metric way the progress and the intervention. So not just looking at the financial aspects, not just looking at WASH or health independently. So thank you. That was a really interesting um, uh, comment there. Uh, we've had one thing that was quite common to both your presentations and was interesting was at some point there was a kind of circular diagram uh, and with connections to lots of other sectors. So um, that really summarizes the point that all of these um, sectors and interventions are very much interconnected. And we've got a great question here from Anouk Gouvras, who um, congratulates you for great talks and writes, Sometimes efforts to address a health or development challenge can lead to a problem in another area. For example, increasing food security through water irrigation projects can accidentally lead to an outbreak of schistosomiasis and therefore FGS. How could we approach or and address this? How do we ensure we are working with sectors such as agriculture and hydropower? And perhaps I would add into there the One Health approach to think about the impact on NTDs, such as Shisto, in their risk assessments. And uh, May, I'm sure that is at the forefront of your thinking. And Martyr, I'm also wondering whether at Max Foundation that is something that you really think about at the onset of your projects. Yeah, um, I think with the integrated water resources management, we have to try and incorporate health into it. Uh, when you're looking at integrated water resources, that's looking at water for multiple use, whether it's for irrigation, for hydropower, or for domestic water delivery. Most times we don't talk together. We kind of work in silos where everybody is um, interested in their own little area or whether it's big or little, but in just interested in their own area without considering how it all interrelates or interconnects and one affects the other. That is the problem, whether it's down to funding because we're all uh, fighting for the same sources of funds, I don't know, but we need to be able to connect and work intersectorally. That's the way we can get around this because you will realize that the people in agriculture do not have an inkling about how their work is going to affect the explosion of, of new nails, uh, snails species in an area that will create an outbreak of schisto. You know, it's quite, um, most of us are just limited to our own area of knowledge without knowing how what we're doing affects another side of the community or another side to the community. So the best thing to do here is proper integration. If we're able to integrate the work that we're doing, just like they have done in integrated water resources management, incorporating that health from the um, multi-use and effect approach, including that into the risk assessment. The risk assessment is supposed to be there during environmental impact assessments. They're supposed to do those things and look at how it affects the community. But if you go try and you read, you hardly see anything to do with how the health of the people is affected. So most times that is put by the side and it's not uh, because they, 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 sometimes it's not actually on purpose that they do it, but because they don't know. So that awareness needs to be there. That working within health and water and um, economic development, because agriculture is classed as economic development. So putting all that together in one package, not as separate silos is the best way to move forward in terms of making sure that the um, progress being made in one sector is not causing a consequence that is quite um, disastrous for another sector. Because if the progress in irrigation and agriculture and economic development is causing a disaster to people's health, then um, we have not really made progress. So the best way to achieve progress is working across sectors and making sure that um, the impact of one activity on another sector is not a their, um, problem. It's more like trying to have a holistic approach 
to uplifting people out of poverty. They should have it all. They should have water. They should have health. They should have agri. They should be able to have money in their pockets. So it's not about one sector. It's about people generally and lifting them out of poverty. And we need all sectors together, working together on board to be able to achieve this. Yes, I think what has really worked for um, for us is having uh, also having an interdisciplinary team. So I am not a, a I'm not an engineer. Um, I leave that to the engineers in our team, and they they look at it more from a technical perspective. But I bring in the health perspective, and someone else brings in the business and the marketing expect perspective. And I think because we come at it from different angles, um, and also it's important to uh, to test these things. So we had a long, we had a three year pilot phase in which we tested different iterations of the models and in which issues like this come up and we can address them. So I think having that really testing it um, and, and also having that interdisciplinary team um, is very important to avoid these kinds of issues. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, just thinking to the future, in the UN itself kind of states that about 60% of the cities that will exist in 2050 haven't even been planned yet. And uh, this is kind of ties into a question which I've, I've managed to lose in the chat. It is somewhere there. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to give the name of the person who pose this really interesting question, but kind of contrasting the urban water experience versus the rural one and thinking about the fact that 60% of our future cities are going to appear, haven't even been planned yet. What is something that you might want to say or what would be the message specifically to the urban planning sector or to those looking at sustainable cities, maybe even mayors and the political will at that level, what would you like to say to them in terms of wash and health and what they should really consider at the forefront? It could be something quite broad or on a very practical level. I think when they're constructing or when they're thinking of planning new cities, every infrastructure should be thought through carefully at the planning stage. And that's whether it's water or electricity or drainage facilities, um, transportation, every infrastructure that is necessary should be planned properly, you know, and in the, at the design stage. So it is, everyone definitely has to be on board at the design stage. And in terms of implementation too, that should also be considered. Every, every household needs to have adequate service delivery. If you're planning a new city, you cannot be planning a new city and thinking you bring in the water afterwards. At that planning stage, you need to design for every um, household to have access to water, to have access to sanitary facilities, to have access to road, a road to the front door possible or um, having electricity as well so in terms of water and health if you're able to put in water and sanitary facilities that's half done to get the um, health outcomes that you need um, historically we know that water and sanitation has been at the forefront or was at the forefront of removing uh, of improving the health of cities and towns in london we had john snow when there was a cholera outbreak he was able to identify the fact that the cholera outbreak was from um, contaminated pumps due to unsanitary conditions. So once you're able to tackle water and sanitation at that planning stage and make sure at implementation stage, you have all those in place and other infrastructure, then definitely the health of the people will be um, kind of safeguarded at that stage. So I think it's thinking through all the different parts of health, of water, of sanitation, of roads, of electricity, the whole infrastructure that is necessary for a people to live a decent life, you know, if we can have that in place at the planning and design stage and then making sure it's implemented. 
So that's what I think should be done for future mayors to think about. Mm. Uh, I completely agree with May. I think this kind of planning and designing from the start is, is very important. Um, very practically also what, what I would add to that is to say, I think in that planning and designing, um, even though you need to design for the whole city and you need to design for everyone to have this, this similar level of access, um, that doesn't need that doesn't mean that it needs to necessarily be one giant system for the entire town because this is where we see that a lot of cities now for example dhaka really struggling um in terms of being able to provide water with one system one comp one public company that needs to deliver for the entire city that's not necessarily um the easiest or the, or the best way it might sound easy but in in reality it's not always easy so i would also like to see whether we can think more creatively if if smaller systems if more smaller systems that may be able to, to just cover one area um and that work together to ensure that everyone has coverage might be another way of of ensuring coverage for the entire city yeah and just add quickly like um Matter has, has rightly said decentralized systems. So you're not having just one central system. Even in London, we don't have one central water system. We have people being provided water from different um, water co companies. So it's it's, slight, it's almost decentralized in that sense, in, the, in that you have some are receiving water from Thames Water, some from Affinity Water, from from. So it's mm -hmm. decentralized in some way. That is a lot easier because you can expand services even when you have expansion within the community or within in the town itself you know so it's a lot easier to manage than just having one centralized system thank you very much and that question and uh had come from kefa makumba who got us thinking about um water urbanization and kind of the, the future. So thank you, Kefa. Um, we've got a really interesting question here from uh, Isaac Chikwana. Is that Isaac's uh, connecting from the Dihid Fund? Hi, Isaac. Uh, Isaac writes, thank you for the presentation about the Max Foundation work. I work on access to medicines and I'm an advocate for sustainability, so I like this model. I'm just curious to know how you deal with failure to pay the monthly fee. Uh, we all know if this were a council service, they could just cut off the water supply until the bills are paid. Um, but do you have the same approach and what reactions do you get from the community? This is a interesting question. Very interesting question. Um, yes, well, we have a similar approach. We do give people a warning and that's usually enough if they haven't paid the bills for two months um uh, uh sort of the threat of of being able to disconnect is usually enough um and this actually was also one of the reasons why this smaller scale model worked better than um some of the big models that we tested so we had uh bigger installations but there you lack the the actual the social capital that comes with this smaller sized grid so when it's 75 households, they all know each other and they know the person that is collecting the tariff. So it becomes a lot more difficult for one household not to pay because they feel that social pressure and their neighbors are telling them that, hey, if you don't pay, uh, we're all going to suffer because the system might fall down, you know, might collapse or the, the sustainability might collapse. Um, and they, so in that sense, that was one of the reasons actually why we chose to continue with this um, smaller, like cluster based system. Um, May, you're welcome to add to that if you would like to. Um, it's entirely up to you. Um, well, right, like she said, that cluster system, it's, it's, I think it's the best approach in that context. So you have to be, it has to be context specific. That's what we have to be very careful about. And um, I know, for example, a village in Nepal where they have the same a similar community water service. There was an old lady that was not eating because she had to pay for the water. And to her, she felt that water belongs to the community and she needed to do her part as a social kind of thing to keep that water flowing. So she would rather pay her water fees, her water tariff, 
than having three square meals in a day. It was a sad a choice for her to make. She shouldn't have to make that choice. But it's also to draw the, um, to the fact that people are usually willing to pay. Most times we assume they don't, they're not willing to pay, but they're usually willing to pay. Um, I remember when we in Tanzania, along the banks of Lake Victoria, they have water vendors who supply people with water. And the people pay more than 10 times they would on that of true normal regular delivery. You know, if they, if they were piped systems, they'll pay much less. But because these are water vendors who collect the water from the lake and sell to them, they're having to pay much more. So people are usually willing to pay for water if that's the choice that they have to make. We shouldn't just assume that people will not pay and think it's a free service. There are those who definitely will have the, the odds, the, the people, the numbers that will say they're not paying because it should be a free service. But many of them are willing to pay the tariff as long as it's not something that is exorbitant, it's something that is reasonable and within the limits of what is acceptable in the community. That's what we should always um, have in mind or bear in mind. Thank you both. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That's actually such an interesting dimension that we um, don't necessarily think about, but that's been really informative. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming up toward the end of our session. And there's been a lot of questions, honestly. Everyone has enjoyed your presentation so much. And perhaps we could just conclude with one last question that's been asked here um, by Wangari Wambui. Wangari, you are a master's student at the KU, KU Leuven in Belgium, uh, working on FGS in DRC Congo. Um, and Wangari, you were asking, um, not related to FGS, but one of the challenges Bangladesh face is groundwater pollution with arsenic. Just a thought for future innovation to couple the pipes water with the remediation services. Yes, that's very true. So the model that I showed is one that we uh, work with in areas where there is no arsenic pollution. Um, there are also many areas in Bangladesh where it is not an issue. Um, but areas where it is an issue, that's where we need to add uh, uh, some sort of treatment facility. And we're currently uh, also figuring out what is the best way to, um, to add that and to make sure also at the end that it still is uh, a sustainable model, both financially, but also operationally, that it needs to be sustainable. Of course, thank you. May, would you like to add any thoughts? Um, yes, just like she said, Bangladesh is one of the areas that has high arsenic um, pollution in the groundwater. Groundwater resource was seen as the resource that didn't need further treatment. So it was launched massively in, in, in Bangladesh. And then the result is having this now huge problems with arsenic pollution and the consequences it has on people's health as well. So I think um, people is just understanding where the areas are, like she said, that are highly polluted and then put in an additional treatment facility to treat the water before it's being distributed. I guess that's just the only way to go about it. And maybe actually this could be a kind of collaboration or partnership point as well with those working in visceral leishmaniasis where the arsenic uh, comes in the way of the antimonial treatments. So perhaps linkages there that could lead to um, new funding kind of advocacy or or partnerships something to bear in mind okay well we're coming now definitely to the end uh, i just wanted to thank our speakers you've really inspired us today you've given us a lot to think about a very big thank you to all who tuned in um uh eugene Ruber and Ziza just gave us a little insight here before we leave into how WASH and NTD collaboration has been going very well in Rwanda. Eugene writes, in Rwanda, the NTD program managed to promote and establish a multi-sectoral sub-NTD technical working group with members coming from all relevant sectors, including WASH. Members were officially nominated by their institutions and they meet regularly to plan and evaluate progress. So that's really inspiring to hear and something to a model to turn to. 
Um, Philippe Odida, you tuned in today. You write, thank you, May, for the wonderful presentation. FGS is a monster tormentor to the victims. And that is a good way to phrase it. Um, so thank you for that. And we've learned so much. Uh, we had Linda Mlangeni tuning in from the University of Ghent in Belgium. Emmanuel Ansa, thank you for joining us from the University of Ghana's Institute of Environmental and Sanitation Studies in Accra. John Oldfield, wishing us a good morning, a very early morning for you since you're tuning in from Washington, D.C., and many, many more that I couldn't greet right now. And also thank you for all your questions. We haven't been able to answer all of them, but I'm sure our speakers today would be more than happy to continue the conversation uh, at another time. So thank you to all of you. May, Matya, Ifeoma, thank you so much for your time today. We've learned a lot thanks to you and we'll definitely uh, be watching this space for all the amazing work you've been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.